Hello! Today I'm going live with Tal and Kasha. We're going to talk about filmmaking in LA and being a duo. Um, let's see, LA filmmakers. Hey, Minna! Yay! So I'm smiling partly because I have this amazing scene going on behind me, which is that my boyfriend and I just set up this day bed outside. And Tilly the dog, I'll show you a second. Um, they, she's on it right now and it's so sweet. It has this pink duvet cover to it. I'm going to show you. I'm trying not to disturb her. She just stood up. She was all snug. And then she stood up and now she's debating whether to leave. Hello. Hello. Wow. How I wish I was about to start a film festival because you guys are dressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just look like this. This is our everyday quarantine garb. Yeah. You it's look amazing. Under, <laughs> underdressed or overdressed? It's nightgowns or sequin gowns? Well, it's, it's all Kasha's fault because she came down wearing this dress and I was just yeah. wearing just a nice sort of polo shirt. And yeah. I was like, I, I just cannot go on there with her in sequins. So. Oh. So how much of your life as filmmakers is like dressed up? Are you, is it like a dress down career? Is it like a sweatpants it's, career? Actually, it's funny um, you say that. It's more of a dress down career. Yeah. Because a, a friend of ours who is out pitching, um, he's a writer and he was out pitching to HBO to this woman he pitched before. Okay. And the session went really well. And as he was leaving, she said to him, she goes, cause he was wearing, he's wearing like, um, like brown slacks and he's wearing a little sport coat. It wasn't a suit, didn't match, and a button down shirt. And she goes, you know this little professor thing you're doing? She said, don't do that anymore. And he's like, what? She goes, they expect writers to be in t-shirts and jeans. They expect you to look like you're, you know, you're, you're not really thinking about what you're wearing. You're just a writer. So she had a very specific expectation <laughs> of how dressed down he should be as a writer. Isn't that funny? Do you funny? guys go out to shop? Like if you have an audition, um, an acting audition, do you go out to shop for new clothes together for your audition outfit? Well, we don't audition? Yeah, I haven't done that in ages. So <laughs> yeah, not, I mean, I think the last time I was auditioning was when I was in Atlanta. And so. when I've um, And when I've played creatures, I usually just get hired because I have like a freakishly small head or freakishly long arms or like freakish neck. It's not really so much um, auditioning for anyone. It's just sort of working with people that sort of love the weird parts of your body. But when I did it, it was always just wearing whatever the character would wear. Like back when I auditioned, uh, I remember I auditioned for a newscaster. So I wore like a jacket and a tie so that it would, so I'd look the part. Got um, it. And so it's more about matching the character than a specific uh, outfit that I'd wear. So the costume. Not, not like when models audition, they all wear like white t-shirts because they just want to be like neutral. Right. It sounds like that's not the case in acting. Like you more dress towards the part. Absolutely. Yeah. But I haven't done it in ages, so I don't know if that's changed. But I, I think that's kind of the, I think that's still the sort of standard. But it's, is it the case that you're both still acting, but like you don't do auditions because you just get parts through people you already know? Is that what you mean by you don't do auditions anymore? Um, well, Tall hasn't acted in like a decade, I think. Um, and the parts that he was getting at the end were actually me casting him because I felt like he was getting, you know, the good guy roles, which I think is pretty boring. And I, I think he could do better. Um, and then the things that I've done as an actor, um, I've only actually played a human one. <laughs> um, That's in your regular life, right? <laughs> yeah, but it was really strange because I, even then I got that role um, as a misunderstanding. I was, uh, this guy, David Gerson, that I know this filmmaker, I've met him at parties and we were at a party one time and he said, oh, I'm you know, doing this thesis film and I'd love for you to be in it. And we had been talking about movement theater and things like that. So I sort of showed up and, and I thought that I was gonna be a tree or something. Yeah. 
It's supposed to be World War II about this theater troupe that had survived World War II. It was supposed to be sort of an avant-garde film. So Kasha figured, oh, it's just going to be yeah. movement or something really weird. And I thought it was going to be, you know, like a creature or a tree or something dark in a forest. And then I noticed one of the character names was Kasha. And I was like, that's so strange. Um, <laughs> and it was supposed to be in Polish. And I also thought, oh, that's very strange. Uh, and then I, you know, I get there and he's like, oh no, you're, you know, we we're doing rehearsals and he's like, oh no, you're playing Kasha and you're going to be an actual girl, Holocaust survivor. And I, I just remember thinking, what? <laughs> Cause I'm so used to having, you know, a mask or prosthetics or something and having to actually be human was very, very strange. And yeah, but the, the, con the concept was really interesting for the short because he initially had studied his grandmother was, was she a Holocaust survivor? I think, or, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and so he, um, but he had read about these, this Polish theater troupe, but they're all little people, the whole troupe was. Oh. And that's actually what he wanted to do the short. But people, when they're casting it, they're like, to try to find people who can speak Polish and our little people is going to be nearly impossible in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, right? <laughs> so he changed it to just uh, just regular sized people, and um, but then that's how Kasha got it because he knew she spoke Polish, and um, and he actually won a Student Academy Award for it. So, wow, um, it turned I out beautifully. To something it's Kasha said, I found it interesting what Kasha said. She was like, Tall was getting parts um, where he was like the typical good guy. And you you said something like, and I didn't think that was so interesting. Tell us, like, as a partner of an actor, or like at least a part time actor, what roles would you love him to be getting? Like, what kinds of roles would fascinate you for him as your as your acting colleague? Well, I think um, you know he's. I know him intimately. Um, I don't think any of my nieces or nephews are on here, right? And this um, is just bubbly water. It looks fancy, yeah. but it's actually not well, alcohol. Very sober. <laughs> I'm um, disappointed in you two. That doesn't seem so typical. No, no. We kind of ran out of alcohol last night. Yeah, we I don't have any champagne, so we just put Scotch. a nice little Scotch candied orange. Is that what's in there? Candied lemon. orange or lemon in a nice little coupe glass. So we'll have to do an announcement for you that you need a you need a liquor sponsor. We need yes. A sponsor. Um, okay. Champagne is lovely. But as far as roles go, when I met Tall, he was doing theater. And then also, um, he I love that he used to do, you know, those reenactment things like FBI files. So he was always like the good cop, you know, or the, or good, the detective, the, detective or like the good FBI agent that was going to, um, you know, take down someone uh, and, you know, or like covering bodies with blankets. And he was just always playing the good guy. And... Uh, I feel like he's a little bit more complicated than that. I think we're all a bit flawed and not, a bit not really. She's being generous. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's always, and you know, I suspect actors too, I think women to have this problem a lot, you know, they're always playing like the doting wife of the astronaut. It's funny, we were trying to watch some space movies this month and I was like, oh good, look, here's four movies where there's sort of a woman that shows up as a blip and she's the doting wife left back on earth. Uh -huh. yeah, that's that's it. That's all they get to play. So she wants me right. to put a doting wife. <laughs> is what she's saying. She can be the astronaut, and I can be the doting wife that's sitting at home, like worrying and biting my fingernails. Yeah. Can I mean, you imagine thinking about this the other day? Like you know, when you see a movie and you become aware of these people as actors, you start to recognize that like certain main characters are being probably paid a certain amount, and other characters are being paid less. Like. Is there, what does it feel like to be playing in different roles? Like you're playing a lead actor, you're playing the supporting actress, you're playing a tree. Like how, what, how does that play out in the dynamics on set? And like, how, how do all the actors end up feeling about each other? Um, hmm. I don't know how to be as honest as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> does everybody like hate the main character often? Is that like... You know, no, no. In interestingly, um, recently I've just been to make money here and there. I've been doing background extra work, which I hadn't really done in a long time. Um, and it's sort of fascinating. I feel like I'm undercover, like that show Undercover Boss. Uh, <laughs> because nobody, you know, everyone always thinks that all of ba the background extras are actors, which isn't the case. 
Um, and so as a director, I find it really fascinating because some of the background extras hate the lead actors. They're just like, I could be doing better. You know, they're very grumpy about it. Um, some of them are just happy to have a job. But it's also fascinating because you see how um, stars of films or TV treat background extras and how, mm -hmm. how the crew treats them, uh, which is actually usually very disrespectful. Um, I think TV shows here in LA have actually been the nicest crews that I've been around to oh. background. Um, I think LA, I don't know why they're nicer. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe it's because, you know, like CBD is legal here. Maybe everyone's a little more chill. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Good be. <laughs> Good be. Well, it, well, and in New York, uh, I, was, uh, I was a background PA once, which means that I was on set and I had to keep track of all the background every day. And I had, uh, and I just did my job. I didn't, I mean, I always try to be respectful to people and civil, um, but it was an indie film, about two, $3 million budget. It, you know, it, it was a tough, it was a tough job. It was hard. I was doing multiple jobs every day. You know, I, I would drive cast members there and then I would help load in um, the wardrobe equipment. And we'd have to sometimes put up temporary walls so people could dress. I do all that and also try to wrangle yeah. all the background. Um, so I was pulled thin a lot, but I had people tell me that I was, they're like, oh, you're the nicest background PA that I've ever had. And to be honest, I don't think I was that nice. I <laughs> think that they're used to being treated pretty poorly. And I've seen it as I've been background as well. And they can treat pretty, they can treat you pretty badly. Yeah. But one of the nice things, like Kasha said, is you are invisible, which the downside is they don't treat you well. But the upside is you can kind of watch and observe and they, people don't even think of you. Like for example, like the crew or whatever. So you can actually watch and see what they do, see how directors behave, see how actors behave, see you know the good and the bad, you know, things mm -hmm. they, they do as far as blocking a scene or directing a scene that you like. Yeah. Even just technical things, the equipment they use, you're like, oh wow, I'd never, you know, we work on really low, when we make stuff, it's really low budget. We don't get to see like all the equipment that you have when it's expensive. Right. And when you're just sitting there, background i can watch whatever i want i don't have to yeah. i'm not doing a job that is so, an interesting upside that you can observe more and people oh yeah less from you yeah i, I listen a lot because it's kind of fascinating like the misinformation people have about how productions work and yeah. sometimes i feel like a spy i'm just sitting there going, oh okay that's how yeah. you think it goes <laughs> and then tell i just want to follow up on something you said so you said you know we had we it was an indie film two three million dollar budget which yeah. like, for the lay person i don't i didn't really have the sense that that would be like a typical budget for an indie film um but i know for instance before quarantine you were working on like a netflix film um show tv well your TV show, show sorry TV show, yeah. And then, so is the experience when you're working under a project that's higher budget much different? And also, can you tell us in what capacity you were working on that show? Um, well, on the Netflix show, I was a post coordinator and just- Actually, maybe you should talk about the one that's coming up because that has a lot of more special effects, you know, on Dion. That's what I'm gonna talk about. Oh, okay. Um, so- um, Sounds great, yeah. Because 68 Whiskey was Paramount Network. Yeah. Um, sure. So, I worked on the show Raising Dion, which had a lot of visual effects. In fact, we had an entire, normally when I work on a show, um, we will hire a VFX supervisor and then they'll, they'll farm out some of their work. They may just some, do some of their own VFX <laughs> in-house. Yeah. But on this show, because it was, it's, <laughs> it was so VFX heavy, because there's a lot of creative elements, superheroes and supernatural beings. And it's a really fun show, a good kid and family show. People are looking for one. Raising um, Dion. Raising Dion, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the big star on that is uh, Michael B. Jordan is in it. He helped produce it. He's executive producer on it. And uh, he is in it. He's not in it a lot, but uh, Jason Ritter is one of the leads in that. And he's amazing in it. Um, so, but anyway, but the experience of it for me, um, I work in post and post is actually relatively small. Most post teams. And it was, this is how it was in Dion. It had my, the post producer, 
a post supervisor, post coordinator, me, and then a post PA. So your office people are only four. And then we had four editor teams and each editor had an assistant. So that's another eight people. So our whole office is only 12 people. Now we had a VFX department, which was another, I feel like there were another eight people in that. So it was about 20 people when we were going full on. But also in this, I'm, I'm an administrator. I mean, my job day in, day out on a Netflix show is like almost any other Netflix job. I live in Excel all day long. I'm on my email yeah. all day long. I'm dealing with the copier if there's a problem. I'm helping set up video conferences and scheduling and doing calendars. Um, if you didn't know the content of what I was doing, it's pretty much like any other office job. But then all of a sudden the product is, oh, we're making a TV show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the difference when we work on something, like for example, the one I told you about, the indie film, I was doing, I was working among, we're very compartmentalized in a big show. Like I do one job, that's all I do on yeah. something for Netflix. But then on like that indie film I was telling you about, it was called Untitled, came out, oh geez, long time ago. Years ago. Now, like, <laughs> I worked on it in 2007, so it probably came out in 2008 or nine, something like that. Um, on that, as I was saying, I did multiple things. Like I said, I right. most PAs, PAs, for example, on a show like Raising Beyond, if they were the background PA, that's all they do. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be setting up anything for wardrobe. They wouldn't be driving a vehicle. Um, they literally would be showing up, getting their walkie, dealing with background, and that's what they would do all day long. But meanwhile, when we make a film, you know, we have PAs, and I think Kat joined, maybe she's still on here. Um, she just volunteered for a day or two, and she was kind of doing everything. Um, I think one of the days that I was sick, it was sort of before I ended up having to go to urgent care, but I was sort of like laying on the ground in a fetal position before we were shooting. <laughs> and I was just like saying, you know, could you, could you help gather the wardrobe because the costumer isn't coming in for a little bit. And, uh, you know, she was helping set up chairs cause we were shooting in the, in the sun and putting things in the shade and just doing kind of art department, uh, locations, food help. She was just doing so much, which, I think some people- uh, We even had her go out and shop. She had to go shop for some props. <laughs> yeah, um, the morning of. That, that day. Like, yeah. it's like she is still on, right? Is this yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Kat. Hi, Kat. Um, but she was amazing. Yeah, I forgot, God. Sorry, you did a lot. And obviously I only remember 10% because I'm a moron, but- um... <laughs> Well, you named a lot. I mean, when, when somebody is doing that, when you have that memory of working with someone and you you know, you have that kind of memory. Is that someone you definitely want to work with again? Um, I don't think she would want to she's do a that. <laughs> she's a professional uh, she's a, she works, writer and editor. Yeah, so. she, uh, actually she works for Playboy. I don't yeah, know if that's still gonna happen. Um, hi, yeah. But uh, she she has a real job. I don't right. imagine working with us was like a dream. <laughs> if, she, if she wanted to, we would hire her back in a second. But yes. she was with, basically doing it because she likes us. With cash money next time hopefully <laughs> so i know you've been generous to talk about some of like your side jobs essentially but i know primarily you are writing directing producing duo and you have a collection of short films that you've made together so i want to dive into that and i've i think i've watched everything i've watched everything that's on kasha's <laughs> um website okay like, well that's um, everything then <laughs> and we sent you the private link yeah some other things that will never see the light which, oh, okay. by the way, is there a reason you don't have a joint website? Does it does Tall make you look bad or something? Yeah, yes. pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that's terrible. it. He's super square. Look, <laughs> I, I'm not good. I'm not good for her, for her brand. I, I just I'm we like actually, I'm so off brand. We do have a <laughs> we have a secret together website that we used to have, and it was um it was really funny when we tried to get the uh the website. It was tallkasha.com, but we realized that there's actually a there's a Talk Asia on CNN, or used, or used to, be. to be, yeah. And we never realized that our names together are Talk Asia. Oh. Um, so we had. So we had to put a dash we in had our. To do a dash. Right, we, right. We did have that site, but that site's super old. It was really pretty, and we hired a company to like make these beautiful business cards. It's yeah. sort of like when I thought the aesthetics were so important to everything, 
Um, and we were doing, you know, I had this grand idea of doing theater productions and film, right. um, you know, which was great, but theater basically makes you no money. Um, not that the film has been so lucrative, but. Well, <laughs> but I mean, we made a decision early on. We started out in uh, small professional theater in Atlanta. Okay. And yeah. so we, we helped out particularly we helped out around town, but one group in particular called Push Push Theater Company, which I believe is still around. I think so. And yeah. um, in fact, the founder uh, and his wife acted in a friend of ours film that is coming out this year, which is oh, pretty cool. great. Um, so, so we, our experience working together behind the scenes there, both of us were behind the scenes. I was in a few plays, but primarily I, I was like a stage manager. I helped build sets. And Kasha would help out with, we'd do research and um, we'd actually do things like help out with the box office, pretty much anything that needed to be done. But we started to get the itch to do our own thing. So we thought, well, let's create a company doing theater and film. Right. And so our first project was a, a play. I adapted- uh, <laughs> Don't tempt me. <laughs> Marlowe's Dr. Faustus, who said that? Cat. Um. <laughs> But Quit your job, Catch. I adapted house. Marla's Dr. Faustus, and then we put it up in a play in, in Atlanta. We used to have a black box uh, at Seven Stages Theater. And Dr. Faustus was played by a female, and the yeah, devil we, was really delicious. I played the devil, and Kasha dyed my hair black. So with my blue eyes and my black hair, it was very striking. I looked very strange. And of course, I did makeup, so my skin was very, very light and smooth. So it gave me a very strange kind of ethereal, devilish quality. Tall discovered highlighter in the 90s. <laughs> well, I want to ask you about hair dye, actually, because I noticed like throughout your films, like at least in Bye Bye Blue, she has her hair colored. I know like in many of the pictures I've gone through, Kasha, Kasha plays with hair, different hair colors. So I guess I want to hear Kasha's perspective on like how hair color changes a person's character. Um, if there are any like correlations to specific colors um, that you feel? Do you, do you mean with me or with the film characters? With either. I mean, what what is the um, inclination to use like hair dye as a way to alter a character? Um, well, I thought like with Bye Bye Blue, um, my wonderful friend Alex from New York, um, she's a costume designer and she did like Thoroughbreds and The Spy Who Dumped Me and she was not um, working on anything and, and at the bad time. education which is now on hbo oh, yeah um but she wasn't working on anything at the time had just moved to la and i was telling her basically we made the film very very quickly um because i was applying to the uh, afi directing workshop for women and they wanted us to have a new short which i felt like all my shorts were a little old uh so we wrote it or i wrote it i guess in like three or four days and we shot it in less than a month um but I knew that I wanted it to be uh, sort of the most regular of the kinds of stories that I've told because the film that I was writing was actually uh, maybe less fantastical. And so I wanted it to match. And I wanted this, the one thing, the element of me that was in this film, it was sort of like my little love letter to LA, um, but I did want everyone to be a certain color in the film for Bye Bye Blue. And so it felt very important for me to have like the homeless lead have blue hair and sort of her, her imaginary friend would be blue. And then everyone that would help her, I wanted them to be kind of a warm color. So there was like a helpful stranger that's sort of in these peachy pink tones. And then the woman that helps her at the beginning is yellow. And then everyone that's sort of not helpful uh, was in gray or brown colors. I love that analysis, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just sort of a thing I wasn't trying to, and I told the, you know, costume designer, I said, you know, I don't want it to be like a Wes Anderson thing where it really beats you over the head, but I do want people to kind of maybe feel it, not maybe see it, but to sort of feel it because... Because we're going for it to be a little more naturalistic. Yeah. Um, so we wanted more of a hint than an overriding. We're huge fans of Wes Anderson. I mean, so like going with that style, if we could afford it, we'd full on do it. But in this Okay, just for this film, it didn't it didn't fit. Like if you you I know you watched the Bread Squeezer, and that's yeah. like that's like full on Wes Anderson right yes. there. Well, that's what I think is so cool. Like that's one of the things that's so impressive about the work that you two have done together is like 
the aesthetic that you've achieved, ostensibly mm -hmm. on minimum budgets. Um, yeah, it's really <laughs> so impressive. Because um, you just don't see that from your average short film that you come across. Like moments in Bye Bye Blue that I loved. Like I probably my favorite moment is when um, those two guys who I love who see her in the alley. Um, yeah. They come up to her and one of them puts the glasses on her face. Yeah, and yeah. It's like everything is like fine and right at that moment, and she then finds blue, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and to me, that was such like a great moment because I, just as an observer, what I connected to was like there are these moments where everything's just like out of sorts, and then all of a sudden you put on like a pair of glasses, and it's like <laughs> now I can go to the party, or like now I'm fine, now I can work. You know, like well, we do have these relationships to objects. It's, it's very much like that, that whole thing is very much our neighborhood in Los Angeles because we live near a lot of murals. So there's always like these cute boys and, you know, like out, they're overdressed. Yeah. They're styling some photo shoot, you know, and they're all, you know, they, they have like reflectors under their arms and like covered in, uh, you know, whatever props they need. Um, and we got clothes for that scene we could not afford because of our because yeah. our friend had such connections being an established costume designer. But also, there's this. Um, they looked amazing. Those, I, I loved know. the guys that you had. They were yeah, so she, natural. She, she loved doing. Alex loved doing oh, them. She's like, yeah. oh, these. She goes, I love designing everyone, but she goes, I won't lie, these two are my favorite. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> On the edge of West Hollywood, so it's sort of like. I don't know, it's amazing. There's also this homeless person that I haven't seen in a while, which makes me a little bit nervous, lives near one of our alleys. Um, and uh, they're like, they fascinate me. I want to like have a conversation because oftentimes just randomly, I'll see them though like full kabuki makeup. Oh yeah, yeah. Not sure where that came from. And then another day I saw them on a scooter with like a wig um a long flying wig just like scooting around yeah and i'm just like okay this person is homeless but they need but they still do this makeup every they day clearly Fabulous. Have a skill set. Is yeah it, and it's not just like, like drag makeup it's like full yeah. kabuki style it's, i think you should do i challenge you to do a makeup tutorial with that person <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, in the that, time of COVID, I'm not sure. Yeah. Right, um, right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it is sort of fascinating because it's just like, wow, you know, I if I was homeless, I would just be like, where am I going to be? <laughs> yeah. you know, that would be my main concern. Yeah. But they're just like, I need to be fabulous. I'm outside. <laughs> right, right. I think at a certain point, if you're creative, you know, you're homeless, you're still going to be creative. Yeah, I mean, that puts, puts me to shame because I'm, you know, what am I doing? I'm putting on a sparkly dress and that's the most I'm doing in quarantine. Um, we, Steve and I were talking about Bye Bye Blue last night and I actually had him taking notes in my notebook because we were eating dinner. <laughs> and so he was taking notes and that made me so happy. I just can I, can I say that that's adorable? That's so he wrote down, adorable. he's so adorable and his handwriting is amazing. He says, inspiration for Blue and the main character. So can you tell us about the inspiration for Blue, which for those of you who haven't seen Bye Bye Blue, Blue, as I see it as the observer, Blue is this like fuzzy character, like a grown up stuffed animal. And um, he travels around with this woman, this homeless woman that we've been talking about. And it, he is a source of comfort and creativity and companionship and fantasy and escapism. So how did you get inspired to make those two characters? Um, one of them is sort of a naive, uh, a very naive, like childish, thought that I had when I first moved to the United States because we um, I came from the United States from communist Poland and we immediately landed in New York and it was just like you know coming from this like really poor and ultra white country and then being like dropped in the middle of New York City which is just like so many things that I'd never seen I was so excited my mom was constantly just like trying to chase me down uh, but I remember were you, Kasia, when you landed in New York um, five, I think I was five. Wow. Years old. But so what was fascinating is, and then we immediately like moved down south to Atlanta, Georgia. But one of the weird memories that I had, and then sometimes to this day, I sort of like childishly still have, I used to see, you know, homeless people that would be talking to someone that I couldn't see. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, now I know that's probably a mental illness, and it's probably not great for them. But I remember thinking as a child, I was like, that must be so nice to have someone when yeah. you're like, I'm homeless, but I have this friend 
Um, and now that I'm older, I see people, you know, having serious arguments with their homeless, uh, invisible friends. Right. Well, which is a little more worrying. Um, but there are people like that. I was on the bus coming yeah. home once and there's the guy sitting in front of me um, who I thought was on, you know, because now everybody has the the cordless headphones yeah. and um, I just thought he was talking to somebody on his phone yeah. because he was dressed fairly normally. There wasn't anything that that yelled homeless about this guy or m mentally ill or anything. But then he was just having this conversation, just a really regular full on conversation just with himself. He had no he had no phone in his hand or nothing in his ears. And it was kind of it was kind of striking. And so I think that was kind of one of the things is yeah, this, and it's sort of strange because yeah. you know, I think we, uh, those of us who don't hear voices, uh, when we see that, it's startling and disturbing. But for some reason, you know, my childish brain growing up wasn't disturbed when I saw people doing that. I thought, oh, that's so nice. They have someone, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I well, thought, are oh, you an only child, or did you have siblings, or? No, I have. I had a brother, but he's six years older, so it's okay. essentially, you know, not having a sibling. Yeah. Um, and, and he was, yeah. He's a boy. He didn't, you know, we had to share a room for a long time. So basically, he was just like, get out of my life. The yeah. minute we had separate rooms. So I bet you um, would like some kind of imaginary friend. Had you been able to muster up that fantasy? I, you know, it's funny. I was very good at being alone. And I was really good at um, having stray pets that I would hide from my family. So I didn't Aww. really, I didn't really struggle like with yeah. loneliness as a kid because and, you know, so now quarantine to me is just sort of like, you know, I've been doing this since I was five. Right. Especially with one <laughs> other boy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we don't like the limitations of it, but our day in, day out experience isn't that different because we're homebodies. The main thing we miss is we love to go to a bar or restaurant for a good meal or a good drink. I would say that's the main thing I miss. But that's only like, a, we do that four times a week or something. So that's... <laughs> That's not even that much to lose, so. Um, speaking of which, if you feel comfortable, do you, would you talk about what it was like to get um, tested? Oh, sure. Um, I'm interested in this, so just give us, yeah, give us a, a subject line so people know what we're talking about. So we live in Los Angeles, and right now you can get free, uh, just regular coronavirus testing. I'm not sure why the antibody testing isn't free yet because that seems kind of important um it's a little depressing because it's like you know deep into may and people still aren't getting tested and i've had several friends actually say oh why'd you get a test did you have symptoms and it's mm -hmm. like we right. can't like, like, I have symptoms i just wanted to know we should all know yeah, yeah. And yeah. also because neither of us are feeling sick um i mean early on kasha had something what it's this thing like we're all questioning yeah. What, it was. what was that? Was that it? Because I even had like out of the blue some weird Perfect. vertigo, and I know that there there are um, there are problems with this that have to do with your your spinal cord and and so forth, yes. and so are your um, your brain. So I was like, was was that it? Because it just kind of came out of the blue. Totally. But but with this, it was mainly. We actually just I, I kind of wish everybody to you know they're opening things back up. I wish everybody who can get a free test would, especially people who are working in a store, because um, it's like if you're going back to work and you're going to be around people, I think you might want to you know say oh I tested positive or negative for this, um, which is you know I feel like every employer should encourage their yeah. employees to do it. And also, I think I'm going to have to go see my cardiologist soon. And she's been having a little bit of tooth pain. So yeah. she's like, I want to be able to go. And tell my doctor. You say, know. hey, oh, I tested negative. Yeah, um, yeah. And how long did it take you to get the results back? We haven't we gotten We haven't gotten them. That's kind of okay. a disappointing thing. We did it on Thursday. Um, we just went online and picked a time. And there's tons of locations now. Yeah. Um, and, and there were plenty of slots at the d place we went yeah, to. Yeah, there was like 190 spots left at the 11 o'clock time slot that we had. Okay. Which was yeah. insane. Yeah. Because I thought, oh, God, I you know, I hope there's more than like two spots left. But yeah. it's like 190. Um, but it was very easy. It was just a, a mouth swab and you had to Yeah, cough. we didn't do the one that goes in your nose. We just did okay. the one where you they, they give you a little packet. You drive up. You put your number on the window, your confirmation number, and we had two, and they hand us our bags, and inside the bags, they hand it with like the little 
you know, the thing you pick up garbage with. Yeah, they yeah. have one of those and they hand it to you. Thanks. Um, so they hand it with that. And then it was really simple. It's just like a long Q-tip and you just, you have to really rub it around. They make you cough first, just with a cough three to five times really heavily. Yeah. And then you rub it on inside of your cheek, back of your tongue, roof of your mouth, inside like of both cheeks, lower cheek, upper, upper cheek, and trying to really get that as much on the, the, the little uh, Q-tip as you can. And then you just stick it in a vial and it breaks off and you seal the vial and you shake it, put it back in the bag and, and then you're done. Back. Awesome. You know? We did a good job because we both almost made ourselves vomit. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we, we both yeah, coughed, we were like, uh, coughed really good. hard because they well, said that was good to get stuff out of your, out of your, if there's anything in your lungs, yeah. try to get that out. Um, you mentioned the bread squeezer. So I want to go into that because that was amazing. So first of all, where was that filmed? That was when we were in Georgia, Atlanta. Got it. Okay. And, and where did you find that store? What was that store like on an average day? That store we built. What? So it took us like a month to yeah, build. Yeah, that's, that's in Just a... Just him, really. And then I, I, I was like, I was a real jerk. I was like, I need you to make walls that wheel away. <laughs> that's incredible. Okay. Wait, so you put together that whole store. You like went so, on Amazon and yeah. bought all... And we, so we found the... We found the, the exterior was up in uh, is it Buford where was it in Georgia it was in a suburb of Atlanta Swanee, Georgia. Swanee. yeah it was I in to, Swanee I used to jump trains which I would not recommend to children now it's very probably dangerous but where I lived in rural kind of Lawrenceville which is now a tech place uh when I moved there it was like a horse town and we used to go near my high school and like wait for trains to go by and then like train hobos of old <laughs> we would jump on trains and see where we'd go uh so yeah there's this place where i used to jump trains and i was like oh god there's this weird tiny little store yeah so that's where the exterior was it's a it was a it was like a consignment <laughs> sort of thrift store and we just paid the woman to let us use it for that day just to do the show the front porch area and going through the door in and out through the door Yes. But then the inside was we just built on we we rented a big 2500 square foot raw space. And then we just built that set inside of that space. And what about um, Aunt Crab's house and the gate? <laughs> um, oh, the gate was in our neighborhood. We just um, found a gate. I think we just stole that one. I don't think we even got permission. We, we just drove we down the street. Stealing. Yeah, we drove around like looking for the gate. Like the crab yeah. thing you built yourself. But yeah. then her kitchen, we built that. Um, wow. And uh, but then her her bedroom was an actual house that we repainted. We and the hallway was an found, actual house. We found a bunch of people who had sort of let us use their space for like $100. And we just said, so we're going to repaint this place. <laughs> you know, it's like, give us your home. We're going to repaint it. And then we'll paint it back whatever you want. And most people actually sort of preferred Check the new color. Yeah, they preferred it. This one woman who let us use the kids' bedroom for joy, her kids loved the red, but uh, she was selling her house and she was horrified and hated it. And so we had to us... paint it back in neutral. Yeah, like, like yellow. Like white, yellow. Yeah. Are you guys tempted during um, quarantine to film inside your house? Ooh, I just burped. That's how I feel about it. Uh, it looks why like does it, Yeah, up. why do you know, why does that make you burp? Uh, well, we have no equipment. Um, Okay. I don't even like my laptop's basically dead right now. Got it. Okay. Sort of like it's sort of funny because I, you know, I've been thinking about um, moving more into doing stop motion, which is not something I've ever learned how to do. Um, but I'd love to somehow find a way to like move some money around and get a laptop and some sort of camera so I could start playing with some stop motion. I right. think. That is something that appeals to me because there's like a dead mistresses project that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Well, um, that's, I, I wanted to ask you about that actually about funding. Like, do you get tempted during this time to do like an Indiegogo or GoFundMe or a Kickstarter to fund no, like a new project? No, no. I, I feel like most of my friends aren't working. So our friend McGinty's on here, I think. Yeah, yeah. please feel free to read that question and answer. Um, so uh, McGinty said, I have a question. Who is this McGinty and how has he, she, it <laughs> been an 
influence on you guys. He's been a tremendous influence. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no, he's. How uh, has it been an influence on? He's us? one of our new. He, he's. It's funny because he's from um, California, but he. Um, we met him in New York. Um, when he was working on the television show Bored to Death, which we loved, a fantastic show, and uh, not Bored to Death, excuse me, Boardwalk Empire. I was on. Board Kasha to was death. on Bored to Death. He was on Boardwalk Empire, and then they used to have these um, softball games where it was called Bored B O R E D versus Bored B O A R D. Um, so it was Bored versus Bored, and uh, but anyway, Ka he worked across the hall from Kasha, or he kept coming by her office. So that's how we you know we met him. a lot of a lot of elevator rides together yeah <clears throat> um but how has he influenced us tall <clears throat> um has he influenced hmm. us he's kept us going he's one <laughs> yes. of those people that uh actually like, we... i remember a few years ago when i was having a bit of a crisis with um you know well i'm always having a career crisis it seems like <laughs> but uh we just went out for coffee and it was great to talk to him because he's definitely one of those people that if you can find a way that to follow the art, you know, he wants to follow it. But he, like us, has run into a lot of just physical, practical impediments. You know, how do you pay your rent? How do you get the money for your projects? How do you convince other people to work with you when you don't have a lot of pull? You know, you use what you can, but it's tough. You know, when, when you don't have a, a recognizable name, you don't have a lot of money, um, making films, especially the kind of films that, that Kosh and I want to make, which tend to be very high concept, high production value, they're difficult to make on your yeah. own. Can and you break so down those terms a little bit for us? Like, especially for anybody listening who's like maybe trying to break into the film industry, what does a high concept film mean? <clears throat> and why did you guys decide to focus on that? Well, I think of like the films that I would want to make that are high concept would be sort of like, um, Julie Taymor, I don't know if you saw Titus, or maybe um, like Guillermo del Toro's uh, Pan's Labyrinth, which is just at the core, you know, a fairy tale of a little girl, but then it's just this whole imaginary world that she has. Um, those are the kind of high concept films that I want to make. I want to make things that are troubling, you know, usually an orphan involved. <laughs> Who doesn't love an orphan? Um, some sort of fantasy fairy tale or even like horror elements. I think those things really appeal to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I think high concept usually, not always, but usually involves, um, can involve much more extensive, like for us, we like creating worlds. And you're definitely high concept if you're trying to create, not just shoot in what you have existing in, in Los Angeles, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you try to create you know, we just shot in Los Angeles, but then we try to create a, a little bit, even with Bye Bye Blue, a little bit of a world within Los Angeles. I mean, we spent with this, with the, you know, like the, like you noticed the hair having the blue extensions in the hair, and then we spent a week looking for a blue house with a tree in front, and I was convinced that it had to happen. And Tal was like, "We're never going to find if we can't a find it, blue house. It's not going to be blue." Wow. But then, we did find a blue yeah. house, and um, but then like even the her little her her little homeless shelter, making sure that was blue and kind of pretty and stylized, almost uh, childlike and not not like grungy. So we weren't going for realism. And I think high concept can also just mean that, which is everything may be realistic, but there's something not realistic happening at the same time. Something I love that. I think that shelter is such a good example. It's like, yeah. you know, you're, it's, to a, to the person who goes to that shelter regularly, it might not look dingy, like in their own world yeah. and systems that is maybe a place that is like pastel and beautiful and peaceful. Um, so it seems like high concept is like you're entering the interior world of the actors a little bit more. And the places that you see are more like their symbols. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, I think a lot of people define it differently, but that's how, that's how we would define it, I think. And then the other term you used, Tal, that I wanted to get clarity on was um, high production value. What does that mean? Um, well, <laughs> not cheap. <laughs> well, that means not using, uh, not using just existing locations. Now, creating locations, basically, yeah. or by existing, I should clarify, trying to find very specific locations because you could use an existing location, which we did, but searching high and low to find one that 
that clearly gives you sends the message that you're trying to communicate to people yeah like in because for example in um in the bread squeezer we thought really hard about every single location the kitchen at the beginning for instance we found in rome georgia and that person was about to demolish that kitchen and uh Cool. That scene I don't think will ever leave my mind with the Christmas. But, oh, I but I wanted it to feel warm and the mother and the father had to be these sherbet pound cake icing colors. I wanted them to be like cake. And so yeah. we needed a kitchen that was like cake, but we needed it to be a 60s-ish kitchen. And I mean, that kitchen, we had to decorate that whole thing because that family was ready to tear it down. Yeah, no, it was basically yeah. empty. And um, so like everything on the counter, Kasha found. But Tal actually had to find like knobs for an old... Stove? Yeah, because the stove was missing some knobs, <laughs> so, so I was actually able to find the vintage replacement knobs, which was no small miracle. And but to me, high production value basically means you spend a lot of money for one on on the camera, on the lenses, on the sets, on the on color the palette. actual sets, the color palette. You you spend usually when people say high production value, that's what they mean. They mean everything looks good like top to bottom, everything looks good. Clothes, like everything you see is chosen and not just happenstance. Yeah. And that usually means more money, almost always. <laughs> I have more questions about the bread squeezer and I know that Steve is on and so he wants me to ask about the characters, but I'm gonna pause with that for one second because I love that we're on the topic of aesthetics. So I wanna return to something Kasha said earlier in our conversation. You said something like, um, back when I used to think aesthetics were very, very important. Um, so tell us your current view of aesthetics, the importance of aesthetics in your work and maybe even in your life and how that's changed over the years. Um, you know, it's funny. I know it changes. How could I have said, was it earlier that I said that I don't think aesthetics are important? You um, said back when I used to think aesthetics were, you know, the most important thing or something. Um, maybe you're talking about the bye bye blue and how you because bye bye blue is probably the least designed yes. project that we've ever done um but we still wanted i know kasha still wanted that wasn't put, as that's true actually you're right that i was not as concerned with like i was in zombie bees or in um the bread squeezer actually any of the rest of them yeah that's true um I still, I still am. It's so funny because I think everything we've done when we were doing theater, even, you know, I, unfortunately, as a director, I've, I've never had the chance to just be a director. I've always been the production designer, a location scout, you know, sometimes costume designer. Um, and I, I sort of, it's funny to me. I can't imagine being able to just direct and then not have a hand in all of those things because those things still actually mean a lot to me because I, I think it does affect you. Like I went, um, you know, after I had lung surgery, I went through this weird period of time where I decided to wear red just for a week, but then I decided to wear red for a month and then it turned into almost the whole summer. Oh, wow. Uh, just as like a social experiment. And it was really fascinating to me how other people responded, um, I think to a color. And so to this day, even when I'm making movies, I think about that or I think about how the world reacted to me just wearing one color mm -hmm. for a month, you know. Like, people what would people say? Like, can you give us a few of the reactions? Um, well, one of the ones I noticed, and I wish Brent Dye was on Instagram because he can attest to this. My friend Brent has mentioned on many occasions, every time he comes to LA to visit me, we go to a museum, we get yelled at. And I don't know what it is about me. Or museum. the two of there's something about the two of them together we're too. We're like just troublemakers. I don't know what's wrong with us. We're just always like being told not we're talking too loudly, or we're not allowed to sit somewhere, or we're too close to something. We're just constantly getting harassed. I don't know why. <laughs> L.A. County Museum, get off my tits, you know. <laughs> Let me look at stuff. But um, but it is really funny because I noticed that when I started wearing red and I went to museums, suddenly the security guards were so nice to me and they were chatting me up and they were telling me personal things about their life. Um, I went with my friend who's an artist to one museum one day and then we went out around town and people were like coming up to us while we were having tea and chatting us up. And she was just like, do people normally talk to you this much? I mean, just complete strangers. It was like 10 people 
in one hour. And I just thought, I don't, I don't know what's happening. I literally don't understand what's happening. Well, hair color does the same thing for Kasha. She's noticed different hair colors get her more responses than other hair colors. Thank God right. I am on. How long did you end up re uh, wearing red? What did you say your final amount was? I think it was about three months. Um, yeah. And then I sort of, you know, because I bought all this red stuff, kind of went with it every once in a while again, I'd go for another week. But it was a little uncomfortable for me because I uh, naturally don't like talking to strangers. It's just really unappealing to me. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I love people and stories and the idea of that, I really hate when people talk to me. I remember when I was single and I'd go out with my girlfriends to bars and men would come up to me. I literally remember being like, why are you interrupting me? <laughs> I'm clearly, I'm clearly drinking with my ladies. Get off of me. And it's funny because I think that's not how you meet people. But, um... <laughs> but Kasha's is kind of like that, uh, you know, that that cat that they say doesn't, you know, doesn't like anybody. And then so Kasha ignores that cat. And so suddenly that cat becomes very interested in Kasha. Oh. So I think there's something about, um, I think there's something about Kasha that gets people wanting to talk to her. It's always been that way. And not just like the example she gave where, an odor. where a guy's like hitting on her. Cause to me, that makes sense. I think it's like an Because odor. she's so beautiful. Do but I smell delicious? Maybe. You do smell delicious. <laughs> but um but part of it is no i we've had it happen so many times that yeah. we just sit down at for a theater performance so it's just some random person sitting next to her and they'll just start talking to her and start telling her really personal things about themselves and i don't know what it is there's something about her face and her manner that people want to talk it to was her. The it, it was the red but she's not an extrovert so it, it can be very awkward for her but this she is always me want to ask you my questions about like you guys as partners, like, and I won't go too deep into it because um, I don't want to make you uncomfortable. But I mean, how do you support each other? When it, do you have certain strategies you use when, like, look, you're in a hard business, you know, like you guys come home sometimes, someone's disappointed, somebody didn't get a gig that they wanted, whatever it is. How do you support each other, especially in the down moments when someone, you know, didn't get what they wanted or felt knocked off in some way? Um, well, this last year was actually like a shit ton of rejection for me because I was applying to a bunch of residencies and um, fellowships. And I, you know, like I didn't get into any fellowships that I applied for. Um, like, and they're very difficult to get into, like Yado and the McDowell Art Colony. Um, and I think tall, I mean, it's just very simple things. Like, you know, he would just bring home some wine and be like, what? do we do next? You know, what's the next thing that you want? Um, and then I actually did very luckily get into an art residency, um, which sadly got I think canceled because you know, of COVID. Got so. canceled. <laughs> I'm not in France right now writing my next feature film, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, and you know, I, I don't think I do anything for you when you're disappointed. I'm just like, that's enough. <laughs> Kasha's like, what can, <laughs> what can you do for me with your disappointment? Um, I'm a Leo. I'm not really concerned with his feelings. No, we, I would say <laughs> uh, just it's easy for us to commiserate because we, I think that's one way to cope with it because we just go like, this sucks. It's unfair. Um, yeah. and, and part of it is like this, just realizing that I, you know, having worked kind of on both sides of it, we, I just know that a lot of decisions are pretty arbitrary. Like people, people get ahead for, like for example, when I'm hiring somebody um, for like raising Dion, you know, we're hiring a PA. And so it's like, um, you get a long list. Actually, I didn't hire on that, that's a lie. In a previous <laughs> job, when I was hiring a PA, I got like a hundred resumes. And so, um, and I actually, that was a fairly, I sent out a pretty narrow call to a small listserv of people I trust. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that was a lot. That was a lot yeah. of resumes. And I just know when I look at those, the people I bring in are, it's pretty arbitrary why I picked the six people that I talked to, you know? And so that's why I try to re remind her, because I think we both take it personally, especially Kasha, and just remind her, it's like, 
look, they, they're basing this on a very small bit of information and they probably excluded you for something incredibly arbitrary. Cause like, let's say I got a hundred resumes and I dismissed 94 of them. There's probably dozens of people in that 94 that would have been great at the job. Yeah. But I just have to come up with some way to weed it down. And I know that like these residencies or whatever, um, or directing workshops. or fellowships or directing workshops, they're no different. They're, they, they've got a huge number and they got to get it down. And the same thing with our short films. And that's become much harder because there's so much content now. I have a question. It's very much a side question, but it's maybe to do with my interest in skincare and beauty. Um, <laughs> but like you as you know, you, you two, um, you know, you plan to act in, to some extent, probably for your whole lives, right? Um, uh, not, uh, not her at all. No, I don't like it at all. No, I always love performing. <laughs> I'm definitely the performer. The irony is she's the one who actually for a while had a career at it because she's in, you know, she's in SAG-AFTRA. It's she so actually cool. made some money at it. I've never, I, I've made a few bucks at it, but my biggest payday, I did these Orkin commercials like 23 <laughs> years ago and I got $350 for one day and I did five commercials in one day. And she most knows, people are like, there's no way you should have only gotten $350. She knows a lot about carpenter ants. I learned a lot about carpenter ants. Right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is less of a, it's, it's less of a powerful question, I think, to ask to just tall. But I yeah. mean, tall, as somebody who wants to act forever, does this influence the way you take care of yourself, The like what you do to wash your skin, how you eat? Well, when I was pr pursuing it more, yeah, they, I mean, basically, I'm not very good with that stuff, Kasha will tell you. Um, but literally in some of my classes- Dove body wash on his face. I know. Oh, right, right, right. With a, yeah. with a koosh, like rubbing my face with the shower <laughs> Probably koosh. pretty good. Um, so, um, but, uh, but she's bringing me around because for one, I, I've been told in classes when I was pursuing acting, they're like, you have to attend to your, your skin regimen. It's like, okay, I know you dudes are not thinking about this but you guys have to think about this, you know, because part of it too, is if you have problems with your skin, it isn't just about being beautiful. Like we had an actor in our short film that had some real skin issues and that's not his fault, but it made it harder to put makeup on him. And then makeup then is harder on his skin because he, you know, he had like some psoriasis and I have that a little bit, like I have a little psoriasis here and here. I think and your here. face is covered by chit chat. No, maybe you need some. But but it's good now because Kosh <laughs> has been having me do this little um face scrub. Yeah. Um, little exfoliating thing, and then another another clean general cleanser. Nice. And then we've been using a little calendula on it. And then if it's really irritated and raw, we've actually just used like um. Uh, it's like a topical ointment. Uh, what is like it? Like Neosporin. Neosporin, nothing fancy. But that really, the Neosporin helps when it's really red, like almost, not bloody, but kind of just like on the edge. Yeah. So. Um, You're selling it. Paul, thank you so much for all those details. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought about it. And I was like, I know Marguerite is into skincare products. And so I, I should say something about skincare. I love it. Um, we just have we just have two minutes. I want to ask you um, about the bread squeezer. Um, did is it true that your father was the inspiration for the father in that? Okay, awesome. Yeah, because, because he's klutzy and he always brought, bought home well, Christmas trees. That's what yeah. I heard. Yeah. Discount Christmas trees. The first Christmas. Or Christmas deck. Actually, trees we got separately. Yeah. So that was a little fudge. But nice. he would get discount Christmas decorations. For yeah, sure. the first Christmas that I ever spent with them, he went to the YMCA and got like a bunch of dead things yeah like <laughs> aging he said my dad like literally used to do what this guy is doing right yeah. Now. yeah yeah he did and i just thought <laughs> you know what time if ever am i going to get a chance to put this in film so. yeah um and then really quickly what's it like to work with kid actors and to direct kid actors oh uh, you know i am not a fan of children i'm not gonna lie i don't like them don't want them but they always want to be around me it's all painful painful but we love <laughs> stories around kids who ended up casting yeah. them and basically for us it's like trying to find kids that can just play and are good at improv because you yeah. can't really control them very much yeah i don't know how to direct kids i oh. just so. kind of play that's good to remember um i want to say thank you to you all um oh, you thank a you. quick piece of advice to someone getting out of film school super young what's your advice for their career oh god you know if you don't 
I hate to sound terrible, but if you don't really love it and you're not in it, just get out now. <laughs> and I would say go to a major market right away. Go to LA or New York. Don't mess around. Because we came out here too late, I feel like. Yeah. We should have done this a long time ago. And use all of your friends to get Yeah, use your friends. Use your friends. Everybody you can think of who's smart and talented. I mean, in a nice way. Don't yeah, yeah, no, not in a good way. I have to say goodbye to you because we're running out. Thank you All so right. much. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Happy weekend.